Phenylcyclohexylpiperidine, or PCP for short, is a psychotomimetic drug with a rich and extensive history. PCP was first discovered around 1926. However, at that time, the medical and mind-altering potential of PCP wasn't known. It wasn't until its rediscovery in 1956 by an accidental Grignard reaction performed by Dr. Harold Maddox that its anesthetic and hypermania-inducing effects came to light. PCP is what we call an anesthetic dissociative. These produce anesthesia, typified by a loss of consciousness. Ketamine is a good example as a member of this family. However, just like ketamine, PCP in sub-anesthetic dosages produces distortions of senses. People treated with PCP describe a feeling of detachment from their body, as well as strong hallucinations and a dreamlike state. The hallucinations produced by PCP, unlike those typically caused by ketamine, were frequently disturbing to patients and gave rise to a state of mania, delusions, fear, and aggression. So it's not too difficult to understand that it was quickly discontinued and replaced with ketamine, which is still in use today as a better tolerated drug for minor surgery, pain relief, anesthesia, and treatment of depression. PCMO, a derivative of PCP that I will be making today, was first mentioned in a patent in 1954 and actually precedes the rediscovery of PCP in 1956. PCMO differs from PCP only in the substitution with morpheline instead of piperidine. After law enforcement started cracking down on PCP manufacturing, limiting precursors like piperidine, clandestine chemists dug up old patents and discovered, along with many other derivatives, PCMO as a prominent replacement. Over the years, it has found its place in the drug market, being sold on some research chemical-like sites. Though PCMO isn't particularly popular and it's probably difficult to even find it as there are many better alternatives. In some countries it is banned, but not where I live. The DEA Drugs of Abuse book from 1972 actually states some analogs prominent of that time. Medicinal chemists and pharmacologists nowadays are still working on the PCP molecule, trying to attenuate its side effects via the method of combinatorial chemistry, which basically means making a bunch of analogs, testing them in computer simulations or in cloned human cells, taking the most prominent ones and then testing them on small animals, working all the way up to clinical trials in humans. I will be making the legal analog PCMO to show one of the most basic methods by which these molecules were originally synthesized. The synthesis was shown relatively undetailed in one of the episodes of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, even though the literature is freely available online. So I thought, let's do the synthesis similarly, but explained in the way I do, since anyone with at least half a brain cell could find this synthesis, and it's also very old, so it's not really an issue to detail it. So to get started, I set up a large flask with a stir bar and add in 250 ml of water as a solvent. Into this, I add 75.6 grams of the salt sodium metabisulfite, which will dissolve and form bisulfide ions. When it has dissolved, I add in 64.8 grams of the reagent cyclohexanone. The mixture immediately becomes cloudy, because it's a bit oily, and the reaction proceeds quickly. A small bit of white solid precipitates, and then the product suddenly all crashes out at once, and the stir bar can no longer handle it. What happened in this reaction is the formation of a bisulfite adduct, with the ketone of cyclohexanone. How it proceeds is first by the reaction of sodium metabisulfite with water, forming bisulfite ions. The sulfur of the bisulfite ion has a free electron pair, and is mildly nucleophilic so it can attack some ketones and aldehydes. This is followed by a proton transfer to give the bisulfite adduct of cyclohexanone. After letting it stand for 15 minutes, I assume it has all reacted and I can use it directly for the next step. So first, in this beaker, I weigh out 47.2 grams of the salt potassium cyanide, which I dissolve in 250 ml of water. I then weigh out 58.2 grams of the reagent morpheline and mix that into the potassium cyanide solution. When it has pretty much all dissolved, I add the full mixture to the cyclohexanone bisulfite complex. First it just sits on top and I try to loosen it by shaking it, but stabbing it with a spatula was more effective and it quickly loosened and reacted. I then just leave this mixture to stir overnight to ensure completion of the reaction, but it's probably already finished in under an hour. In this reaction, the bisulfite adduct of cyclohexanone can react with morpheline and then cyanide to form this cyanomorphelino cyclohexane. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the amine from morpheline onto the adduct, kicking off the sulfide and forming this amino alcohol. 
Then, through proton transfer, this amino alcohol can eliminate water to form an aminium. The aminium can be described as an equilibrium of these two structures. The cyanide ion can then attack the aminium carbon to give this cyano compound and sodium potassium sulfide. When I came back, I turned off the stirring and the mixture separated into two layers with the product on top. So I take this mixture and move it all to a separatory funnel to collect the upper layer and I discarded the lower water layer. To remove any remaining water droplets, I add some anhydrous sodium sulfate, which will absorb them. I then filter it all through some cotton to remove the sodium sulfate again. It's a little bit thick, so I diluted it with some toluene, and also washed it down with more toluene. I added a known amount of toluene, so the calculated weight of the product is about 80 grams, which is a yield of 62%, which is okay. For a later step, I need to dilute it in more toluene, so I top it up till 300 ml and set the beaker aside for now. Now it is time to prepare a Grignard reagent. So I have set up a large three neck flask with a stir bar and add in 24.6 grams of magnesium flakes. I then cover this in 400 ml of the solvent tetrahydrofuran, which I dried with molecular sieves. Diethyl ether can of course also be used. I already started heating the mixture to a reflux and I attached a stopper, condenser and a dropping funnel. Into the dropping funnel, I add 158 grams of the reagent bromobenzene that I diluted in about 100 ml of THF. I add a portion of it to the flask and also a small ball of iodine, which will help remove the oxide layer on the magnesium. When the color of the iodine has disappeared, the reaction seems to start and become darker from the formation of the phenylmagnesium bromide. As typical, it starts to go absolutely insane because I added a little bit too much of the bromobenzene already. Luckily, it wasn't an issue and the condenser kept everything inside. If it's a bigger issue, you can just stack two condensers on top of each other. Anyhow, when it has become calmer, I gradually add all the bromobenzene solution to the flask. When the addition was finished, I left it refluxing for about 30 more minutes to make sure the reaction was complete. And then I add the cyanide product that I dissolved in toluene to the dropping funnel. I slowly add this solution to the flask and the reaction is of course very exothermic. In this reaction, we can react this cyano compound with a Grignard reagent like phenylmagnesium bromide to remove the cyano group and replace it with a phenyl group. We first prepared the Grignard reagent phenylmagnesium bromide by reacting bromobenzene with magnesium in an anhydrous ethereal solvent. We then have our cyano compound, which in solution exists in an equilibrium with this iminium cyanide. Like before, the iminium carbon can be attacked by a nucleophile, in this case the phenylmagnesium bromide, giving the product PCMO and this magnesium bromide cyanide. Afterward, it is treated with aqueous hydrobromic acid, converting the PCMO into its hydrobromide salt and reacting with the cyanide to give hydrogen cyanide, which largely bubbles out, and the salt magnesium bromide. Any remaining magnesium metal will also react to form magnesium bromide and hydrogen. When the addition was finished, I refluxed it for one more hour and it is now an orange solution with a bunch of solid product. Afterward, I set this mixture up for a regular short path distillation to remove most of the THF while leaving behind the toluene. When that's done, I hydrolyze all the product and destroy remaining magnesium by adding 50 ml of 48% hydrobromic acid and then 100 ml of water to dilute it. I then mix it all around to get it to come loose and it starts reacting exothermically. When it has all reacted away, except for a little bit of magnesium, I am left with two very dark layers. The bottom layer contains the water soluble salt of the product. So I separate the layers and discard the top toluene layer. I then bring back the water layer and extract it once with toluene to get out mostly the side product by phenyl. Now I have the solution containing the hydrobromide salt of the product. To make it extractable, I have to free base it. So I start by adding the base potassium carbonate. The reaction releases CO2, but it is behaving different than usual, as the potassium carbonate forms a big chunk that sticks together and significantly slows down the reaction. It seems there is something in here that causes it to clump together and sort of sticks and coats it. When most of the potassium carbonate had reacted away and it stopped bubbling, there was still a bit remaining, but the pH of the solution was still acidic. Oddly, the acidic solution had a difficult time reacting with the base. Even after I tried adding the strong base sodium hydroxide, the reaction was extremely slow and it ended up becoming neutral, but not basic. Normally the addition of sodium hydroxide to water is exothermic and it dissolves easily, 
and it should also quickly react with acids. But here, it wasn't. And even after diluting the solution with some water, there did not seem to be an effect. The remaining solid sodium hydroxide on the bottom also didn't want to dissolve in pure water after I took it out, which was very confusing. Since it was behaving so annoyingly, I just used the neutral solution and hoped most of it could be extracted. Spoiler, this was a big mistake. Since tertiary amines are pretty good bases, we need the solution to be strongly basic, to get it all to come out. Looking back, there are two things I could have done to make it better. First, I could have tried dissolving fresh sodium hydroxide in some water and then adding that solution to the beaker. If that didn't fix it, I should have probably diluted it by doubling its volume with water and then adding more sodium hydroxide solution. Either way, that is not what I did and we will see what the result of that is. So I moved all of the solution to the separatory funnel and extracted it a few times with toluene. I have collected all the extracts in this beaker, but it is orange. And in literature, they mention stirring it with activated carbon can sometimes help to make it better. So I add some activated carbon to try it out, let it stir for a while, and then filter it through some cotton. The color looks almost the same, so it probably didn't do much. I then distill off all of the solvent, leaving behind a nasty colored oil containing the product. Now to clean it up, I first add some diethyl ether as a solvent and shake it to get everything to dissolve. I then filter that solution through some cotton to remove insoluble impurities. Now I have to convert the product back into its salt form, but this time the hydrochloride salt, because that is the most convenient. So I set up a hydrogen chloride gas generator, in which I react concentrated sulfuric acid with sodium chloride and lead the formed hydrogen chloride through this tube. I then put it into the solution and it will react with the product to precipitate out the hydrochloride salt. Unfortunately, the stuff that precipitates clogs the tube. So later, I swapped it out for a glass one with a bigger hole, with a bigger diameter. It seems that first some impurity precipitated, because later on, it started to precipitate a more pure and white product. Either way, when nothing more precipitated, I stopped the reaction and disassembled the gas generator. I then poured off most of the diethyl ether and added some fresh ether to wash it. I left it to stir for a while and then let it settle, and it looks a bit better. I pour off the ether again, but it's still too dirty. So instead, I will use acetone to try to clean it up, in which I mean salts are generally not soluble, and it seems to work quite well to get out the impurities. I then set this up for vacuum filtration and wash it with some more acetone, leaving behind the product as an almost white solid. I move all of the collected solid to this dish and then set it in the oven at 50C overnight to remove remaining acetone. When that's done, it easily crumbles into a powder giving a pathetic yield of 3.7 grams, or 3% of the PCMO hydrochloride. So that's the result of not having a basic solution. So now you see why it is important.